Okay, so continuing with uh, lessons from an American weapons designer. Uh, now we're going to look at cybernetics and the combination of cybernetics with semiotics and uh, reflexive control and neuroweapons. Um, cybernetics, uh, which we'll talk about in much greater detail and depth in another part of this work on artificial intelligence. Cybernetics is the study of control in animals and machines. As was mentioned before, the Pearson semiotic is not just limited to linguistics. It also has had a major impact on control theory and logic of controllers and weapons systems. The American founder of cybernetics, Norbert Wiener, who, interestingly, a little fact about Norbert Wiener that seems odd, is Norbert Wiener was Jewish, an American Jew, but he was married to a, a Nazi. Uh, but Norbert Wiener was the inventor of cybernetics, worked on controllers for radar defense during World War II. As we shall see later, automatic target tracking for radar plays a major part in what we can call semiotic cybernetics. <clears throat> the concatenation between semiotic logic and cybernetic controllers. Norsen was at least aware of the lectures of researchers interested in semiotic control of cybernetics. At the behest of the U.S. Army funded gathering, uh, early work in this field was actually done by Russian AI researchers Dmitry Popsolev and V.K. Finn, to just name a couple of researchers. In research presentations presented by Sandia National Labs, as mentioned before, which is run and owned by Lockheed Martin, is the consultancy of Dr. Robert Birch, a professor of philosophy at Texas A&M University, who actually studied with V.K. Finn in Moscow at uh, Beniti, specifically reviewing semiotic intelligence systems. So it is important to understand the influence of Popsolev and Finn on later American weapon systems designers. By the way, skip over this a little bit. Um, development of the semiotic modeling and situations analysis area. Now, situation analysis. Um, in the military, you're always aware of, um, you know, situation reports. You know, what's the sit rep? Uh, that's basically where the people are in the battle space, uh, what's going on in the battle space, what the situation is. Here we have semiotic modeling of situation analysis area, they call it. It's motivated by a strong desire to make the analysis and design of large complex systems or intelligent systems in general better organized, methodologi methodologically more consistent and formally balanced. One of the features of this new methodology is extraction of knowledge from the descriptive information by its consistent analysis based upon well-established algorithms. This should give an opportunity to make the descriptive information a part of the analysis of dynamic processes of control systems theory. It also requires development of new methods of dealing with large, often multi-resolutional symbolic systems and the use of symbol grounding processes. All this can be now considered a part of semiotics. Um, Ospilev was the creator of um, the situational analysis. Um, he is a, an AI uh, innovator. You know, this is uh, much earlier than like artificial intelligence becomes like a common thing today. This is like oh, 30 to 40 years ago, actually. Later, Ospilev's work would inform and contribute to research in America, where one important theoretician. Working for Lockheed Martin and a one-time colleague of Norsen uh, was Ed Nazawa. Nazawa is cited in Norsen and Laurie's communications as an expert on Pearson logic. Nazawa's work is important in the field of controls. He investigated the automation of controllers from air traffic control, which is radar, to control of intelligent systems. He was the creator of the concept of what is known as the single warrior model, a 
which there is little unclassified information about in open source material. Uh, now this single warrior model we're going to take a look at here in a second in a graphic. Um, but um, it's important to understand that this work is being done for the national defense. And it's being done at Lockheed Martin, a private defense contractor. In Nozawa's work, he has talked about the use of piercing logic to create self-contained automated management system loops, which he called the single warrior model. He uses a concept from semiotics and intelligent systems known as functional loops and applies this to controllers, thus creating a closed loop management system. So, here we, def uh, we go through the definition of what a functional loop is. Um, a functional loop is a closed loop of behavior generation which runs through the following subsystems. Sensors, sensory processing, knowledge storage, behavior generators, and actuators, and a world um, environment. Now, we need to take a look at this graphic here, because this is from his presentation slides that he had prepared from 1995 to 2007 for Lockheed Martin. Uh, what is the Pearson Single Warrior Model? Well, we can see here it's a closed-loop management system. Um, it entered on the outer edges, outside the closed-loop management system, you have environment. That's where you would be getting sensor data and stuff like that. Uh, and the output is basically weapons and what weapon to use after you come to this uh, decision that you're going to make here in this closed loop management system, which comprises from left to right data gathering, a self control, and this is the command and control, or what they call C squared in the military, self control, command and control, and then it creates purposive action control or fire control. And this is where um, fire control is basically setting up the formulas for targeting and stuff like that. But as we can see, it all exists within this closed loop management system that is completely automated that he has defined here using Pearson uh, logic as the basis for this model. The topic of fully autonomous weapon systems has come to the fore in ethical conversations regarding weapons development. For example, the online community of AI developers against fully autonomous weapons. Uh, you can go to this website, autonomousweapons.org. However, there's a recent topic of conversation among weapons and AI developers. Uh, this is like a recent discussion. I mean, this they weren't holding this discussion back in the 90s when they were actually creating these things in, in the United States. This slide, originally from 1995, predates these conversations by some two decades. The question we have to ask is, was automation and cybernetic control put into play in tandem with neural weapons, as suggested by Norseen's writings? Automated thought injection based on machine learning algorithms and situation management. One need not look too far for imaginative nightmare scenarios from Hollywood for such a situation of automated control, automated neuro warfare. Uh, moving ahead. Uh, troubling is the connection of Sandia researchers, again, the Lockheed Martin company, that is a government lab, but managed by a private contractor, Lockheed Martin who worked directly with Nozawa as a consultant to their work that specialized in network assurance and survivability such as Michael Senglob, and they're being influenced by closed-loop automated controllers under Nozawa's piercing model. Meaning that if, a, if system designers for, say, nuclear missile defense, systems designed to withstand end-of-world conflicts, continue operating on their own without human intervention based on the Pearson models, then they could continue fighting wars after there are no more humans to fight, as just one example of how bad this could get. In this case, we have a clear example of a situation of loop controllers and engineers such as Singlob and Nazawa using loops to control weapon systems. Ah, Singlob in the application section of his research paper just using the Pearson model for data fusion. Anti-terrorism, 
cognition-based decision-making, and autonomous system control. Thus, possibly in their designs, they have integrated closed-loop management systems, which is to say fully automated weapon systems, which also may integrate Allen's Pearson genetic algorithms, self-writing algorithms, which we're going to discuss below a little bit. An additional element to the research conducted by Sandia Labs is that of using game theory to be deployed within the systems. Uh, we'll go into game AI and AI and video games, AI and military simulations later in this work. But for now, let's just focus on on the semiotic uh, games that they're creating here for um, for these weapon systems. Thus, with the integration of games into defense systems, we have a computational model that could be invoked, which is based purely on mathematical conditions that claim to model the real world fall short of it. Um, now we're going to start getting into something that's really important here that I think really needs to be emphasized. We're starting to get into adversarial uh, networks, which have existed for a long time now, but are have only recently become publicly known. Um, this game theoretic um, environment here, if you look at it closely you see a blue side and a red side which coincidentally uh, which is what we use in England they say to define the labor government labor versus the conservatives the conservatives are blue labor is red or here in the United States the Democrats are blue and uh, the Republicans are supposedly red but uh, in in cybersecurity, you also have red teams and blue teams, and it's always adversarially related. So we can see this in the architectural graph, how we have this um, this red versus blue. And uh, we can also see in here um, some early examples of elements that become known in uh, generative um, Generative adversarial networks and artificial intelligence research, which have become really popular lately. Um, the graphic from Senglog's presentation, which is similar to contemporary generative adversarial networks architecture, this was originally presented in 2003 in the Journal of Reflexive Control by an American team of researchers. Uh, this is the team that I mentioned, led by Lefebvre at New Mexico State University. Um, we can see the direct influence between Sunglob work and that of the group. Okay, so here is their, this is the New Mexico State University's version. We have reflexive control starting on the left, a modeling of red, uh, then red's preference, then blue's deployment, and then the best reflexive decision. It is an interesting point of understanding that this conception of adversarial networks predates the innovations in contemporary artificial intelligence. For example, introduced by Ian Goodfellow in 2017, I think it was. So that we see the predating of what is considered cutting edge artificial intelligence techniques in the public sector being predated by at least 15 years in the defense sector. This is the covert world. This is where, you know, secret technology is being developed. As, in, as is indicated in Senglob's graph, a pomp D partial observable Markov decision process, which if you're an artificial intelligence enthusiast, this makes sense to you. For the rest of the people, I guess you're just going to have to follow along for now. Uh, of which is interest to GANs in deep reinforcement learning as breakthroughs in AI techniques and such applications of using AI to compete against human competitors in real-time strategy games, such as Warcraft, for example, such as what is viewed as the elite public application of this technique at London-based uh, DeepMind, which is, um, they're some of the, the most advanced uh, um, artificial intelligence um, developers uh, around um, and have been making uh, rapid uh, advances and in, in getting computers to beat humans in these real-time strategy games. And I don't go into it right here, but real-time strategy games, I will go into it later, are used by the military as training and, and simulations. So this is not something to be just dismissed as a, a coincidence or something casual. 
We can see that there is a clear technological lead in the compartmentalized covert world compared to that of the public domain, which, as we shall see later, is also of interest to quantum computation. Where just in the last two years, quantum computational simulations have become public, such as IBM has released its quantum computational framework for developers to work with. But that has only occurred within the last two years, even though they have been developing this technology with the, the Department of Defense, specifically IBM, for at least the last 20 years. Um, so we can that there is clearly a distinction between what is public and what is covert and the gap between these. And I know as a former um, military person who served in one of the most covert platforms uh, that America has as a signals intelligence sonar technician on a fast attack submarine, that this is indeed is true. I mean, this is something we always talked about in the military, that we were always at least two decades ahead of the public sector, and we were always trying to maintain at least two decades ahead of technology on the Soviets, although we can clearly see that on this issue, we were learning from the Soviets more than we were learning from ourselves. The main theoretician on semiotic games is Lefebvre at the University of California. He states regarding his semiotic game theory, traditional game theory is a normative science and is not meant for modeling the real behavior of players. This is important. It's not meant for modeling the real behavior of players. This paper describes a method, the goal of which is to predict the choices of players in real situations rather than to compute optimal decisions. It is assumed that each player faces a choice between two strategies, active and passive. Uh, later in the uh, reflexive control section, we'll be going over um, Lefebvre's uh, binary choice theory. Everything is written within reflexive control, uh, within Boolean algebra. That is your either or something. You're either active or passive. You're either this. You're either this or Boolean. The method is based on structural representation of subject together with his image of the self and another. This representation allows us to compose systems of equations whose solutions are the probabilities with which the players choose the alternative strategies. Um, some glob also uh, goes into this more, uh, but I'm going to skip over this to get to uh, an important point that's missing from these games, and that's known as a Nash equilibrium. Uh, as he points out, uh, no guarantee that the ultimate strategy will lead to a Nash equilib equilibrium. So we need to understand what a Nash equilibrium is. I don't know if you've ever seen the film A Beautiful Mind. This was about um, the mathematician John Nash, who interestingly eventually developed schizophrenia at an advanced, a more advanced age than uh, which is typically known for natural schizophrenia. But he also did game theory, but he also did consultant work for national defense, so it's easy to see how he too might have become a victim of uh, uh, neural weapons. Uh, Nash equilibrium. In terms of game theory, if each player has chosen a strategy, no player can benefit by changing strategies. While the other players keep theirs unchanged, then the current set of strategy choices and their corresponding payoffs constitutes a Nash equilibrium. Stated simply, Alice and Bob are in Nash equ equilibrium if Alice is making the best decision she can while his decision remains unchanged. And Bob is making the best decision he can, taking into account Alice's decision while her decision remains unchanged. Likewise, a group of players are in Nash equilibrium if each one is making the best decision possible, taking into account the decisions of the others in a game as long as the other party's decisions remain unchanged. It is ominous that in a possibly autonomous controlled system that no Nash equilibrium could be reached. Now, in the movie, they use the example of going after um, two Nash and another mathematician are in a bar and they want, they're interested in meeting women. Uh, if they go after the same woman, they're in competition. But if they go after two different women and they're, uh, they achieve a Nash equilibrium, uh, it's kind of like the point here. But you never actually receive, you can never actually get to this like sort of peaceful state, so to speak, in these reflective control games.
But anyway, skipping ahead. As was mentioned previously, the technological rest edge rests with the covert science compared to open source, open domain technologies. One such area of interest is that of quantum computation. It is interesting that many years before the that defense-related computer scientists were already exploring QCs to implement automated decision-making. Simulating the human decision-making process is introduced. It consists of quantum recurrent nets generating stochastic processes which represent the motor dynamics uh, and of classical neural nets describing the evolution of probabilities of these processes which represent the mental dynamics. The autonomy of the decision-making process achieved by a feedback from the mental to motor dynamics, which changes the stochastic matrix based upon the probability distribution. Wow, that's a really big geeky sentence there. Um, basically, um, stochastic, I mean, it's kind of like conditional. It's a conditional, um, conditional matrix a uh, matrix um, is a mathematical term. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it. Um, but this conditional matrix can be is based on a probability distribution. And what they mean by here is it may happen 80% of the time and not happen 20% of the time is one example of a probability distribution. This feedback replaces unavailable external information by an internal knowledge base stored in the mental model in the form of probability distribution. As a result, the coupled motor mental dynamics is described by an online version of Markov chains, and that's the POMP D thing I was mentioning previously, which can decrease entropy without an external source of information. Applications to common sense based decisions, evolution games are discussed. All right, we'll just skip. It is well known to computer scientists that quantum computation gives one an incredible step up in terms of computational power. It would be hard for a classically based computer to implement an advanced algorithm for such decision making in a complex environment such as the fog of war, incomplete information, dynamics, etc., but not for a quantum computer. Um, one last point that's really of interest that is a, a development in the last year or so is Using the same IBM computers, uh, some engineers have been able to demonstrate that you can actually use a quantum computer to step backwards. Uh, in other words, you can re you can go backwards and it's not really time travel. I'm, it's really hard to, to explain this, but they are able to do time reversal using a quantum computer. Um, but it's not really time travel. Uh, in the present to in the past, so to speak. I know that's a gross oversimplification of what they're talking about. But. Another area that has influenced intelligent systems and automation is that of genetic algorithms or genetic programming, which is based on natural genetic selection where a computer compiles its own components and finds the best fit among various modules to formulate an optimal choice. This area was strongly influenced through Piercy and Logic and the founder of genetic algorithms, John Holland of the University of Michigan. It was also advocated by Senglob in engineering automatic systems. Senglob writes, genetic, genetic programming or evolutionary programming technology could also provide insight into design configurations that could result in fault configurations under a set of sets of environmental drivers. Recognizing the basic elements of the design configurations and introducing specialized abnormal environment operators. Genetic programs could be tasked with finding all possible fault configurations that result in unacceptable states for a subsystem. A great deal of work has been performed in which genetic programs have been tasked with designing circuits, structures, and algorithms. So... Not only is it a closed loop management system, but it can actually add components to its system based on what its needs are according to its Piercean analysis, so to speak. So this is also a very ominous um, where things could go dramatically wrong. 
In artificial intelligence, an agent is used to formulate optimal solutions. A more generalized definition of semiotic agents is given. Thus, in turn, the possible decisions that agents can make must be considered relative to those possible actions. The result of all this is that semiotic agents can be cast in terms of a generalized control architecture, as in the work of Powers from 1973 to 1989, where the autonomy of the system is allowed by its manifestation of a closed causal relation with its environment. Through this relation, the agent makes decisions so as to make its measurements, representations of current and past decisions and states, as close as possible to its goals in order to reduce a generalized error function given by its own beliefs of what desirable states are. Thus, as illustrated in Figure 2, six semiotic agents manifest a general, generalized negative feedback control relation. And here is a little diagram of that. Uh, Lockheed Martin is not alone in seeking to use semiotic cybernetics in their defense systems. Uh, Saab Microwave Systems, for example, also is relying on automated intelligence systems, possibly also influenced by piercing and logic. I would assume so, since this technology comes from the Soviets, and they are the ones who use piercing and logic in the at the first instance, and everybody else has just been copying them. As tech is often copied by one company to another, to manage their defense infrastructure. It is interesting and directly related to neuroweapons as their systems of radar and microwave infrastructures, which are both directly related to the technologies of neural warfare. In a presentation online by Saab scientists Hawk and Barston, they show the progression in their thinking. Now, this is a uh, and what they view as a necessity of relying in the future on automated computer decision making systems. Now this graph here shows um, the level of automation you can see in this uh, chart here where it says auto and it gives you compared to manual. And now this is from the year 2015. You can see the, um, the amount of automation compared to manual in 2015. Now, in this next slide, we see how it's viewed in the future. Here we go. And we can see that auto processes are taking over manual processes. And we can read by manual processes, that's human processes. A human is involved. Autos are computer-driven. They're self-managed by the computer. They're closed loops. As one can plainly see from the flies at the time of their writing, relies a great deal less on automated with manual assistance and very small footprints of fully automated. However, from 2015 to 2020, they foresee a large footprint for fully automated computer decision making in their systems. I would imagine that Saab Microsystems is not alone in this trend. Of course, such concepts as reflective control, thought injection, and other messages of this weapons technology would be incomplete without a grounding in brain-computer interfaces, which is also discussed in the artificial intelligence section in more detail. Dr. Norsin cites two researchers re related to this field, one a Russian scientist that works for the U.S. government, Alexei A. Sharov, who is cited by 